Hey guys, sorry for the delay. It's been way too long and I feel way out of line and way off base not being able to make videos, but life keeps happening and I need to make sure babies are fed. So I'm, I'm sure you understand. I want to address this issue we're having today in a teaching crisis. I'm sure those of you who spend any amount of time, and I mean even minutes only a week perhaps, on any kind of social media or any kind of media whatsoever that's addressing the word or trying to address the word or trying to teach from it, you've noticed that there is such a, a huge, massive, like plethora of, of information out there. And I say information in quotes because it's not information, unfortunately, the majority of it is bollocks people it's poppycock it's nonsense and the reason why you can identify it as such is the mass majority of ideas that have any kind of fancy name or any kind of you know sophisticated sounding reasoning generally require absolute rejection of certain verses or obfuscation of the obvious meaning of certain verses that destroy the point what i envision and pardon the worldly analogy but I envision that scene in the movie liar liar where Jim Carrey can't help but tell the truth and he's standing there in front of the judge and he says I object and the, the, the judge goes why he says because it's devastating to my case that is what I see I see people I see people who claim to be teachers who want to seemingly help other people understand their I'm sorry incredibly unbiblical points of view doing so by bludgeoning them and trying to hit them with earthly reasoning and not actually going back to the word. And if they do, they have only one or two verses that they think backs up their position and they go out of their way to, again, obfuscate, cover up, ignore, um, avoid any type of, any type of biblical reasoning that would point in the opposite direction. For example, once saved, always saved. There's a few different ways this goes, and I've gone over this in other videos, but I'll just recap real quick. They say that once you're saved, you can never be unsaved, and if in fact you do move away from the faith, like the, the seed on the rock, they think says uh, that you were never one, one of us, the same way that you know other verses in the Bible you know, like to claim that some, and this is in John, in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, talking about how some had wormed their way into the church, but they, 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 they later separated because they were never a part of us. That very explicitly is talking about people that were never believers to begin with, but the once saved, always saved crowd likes to abuse that verse, ignore its context, and use that as an excuse to say that if anybody was seemingly a believer but then left, that they somehow were automatically never actually saved, which is nonsense because the seed on the rock literally says that this person once believed but then decided to divorce from the Lord, literally apostatize, turn their back on him, and go in the opposite direction, in other words. So, once saved, always saved is indefensible by scripture. Uh, Incredible legalism is also indefensible. You have this long drawn out tirade uh, in multiple epistles by Paul, Peter, and John talking about how these people that come up with these strange, some of them are Torah followers, some of them are, agno are Gnostics, some of them are, there's so many different names for them, I don't even want to get into it because the names are irrelevant. They're people that make up rules, they're legalists that like to think that yes, you have to believe in Christ, but then you also have to go out of your way to avoid sin or you know perform certain rituals or do certain things to maintain that salvation as if anything we do could actually save us, right? When the Bible is clear, the only thing that saves us is, is the cross of Christ, the literal blood of Christ, what he did for us, not anything that we could ever do for ourselves and that we avoid sin in the power of the spirit because we love and respect him and that is what our worship is by following his spirit avoiding sin and his power and 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 doing the things the bible commands because the spirit is the one by the by the by the will of god before life was ever even created good deeds for us to to act out in his power um along along our path on our way to him the narrow gate right so legalism is nonsense one saved always saved is nonsense so many other things are nonsense. Here's the issue. Things like water baptism. There's not actually a single verse in the Bible that could actually sol solidly point to us av actually having to do it. And in fact, I've noted this before too. Peter and Paul both go out of their way to downplay it, make fun of it, compare it to a literal bath. Paul can't remember who he baptized because it doesn't matter. Peter goes out of his way to say that, yeah, water only is a symbol of the spirit which saves us as a gift from Christ after, after salvation. So... In none of these things, in my opinion, does the English, but especially the Greek, because the Greek always clears up these things, show that, that acting out the, the ritual, the rite of, of water baptism, which only was for the Jews, we are told we are to be baptized with the Spirit by the Lord. 
that somehow those two things are the same or one is required for the other. And it always becomes a point of contention. But the Bible's reasonable. God is the God of reason. So what are we doing bickering about water baptism? This is, this is nonsense, right? So 2 Timothy, Paul goes out of his way to give a very long, drawn-out description as to how a teacher of the Lord should be. He should be somebody who never backs down from dividing the scriptures, and that means all of them. See, the thing is, is a lot of these, a lot of these, um, I don't know how else to put it, guys, you're borderline cultists, for lack of a better way to put it, I'm sorry. Because you're unwilling to accept what all of the word says, because the legalists, I've been dealing with this a lot lately, it's kind of silly, and I'm sure some of you have seen it. They like to think that if you were to sin enough, aside from rejecting Christ, that somehow that means you're out of the family. Paul, Peter, John never once addressed this at all. In fact, 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, the man was in horrific, gross sexual sin. But what, is, what does the word say? It literally says that uh, he handed over his flesh for the destruction of his flesh uh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. There's only a few translations that say, so the spirit can be saved, but the Holy Spirit does not need to be saved. So it has to be that man's spirit that is saved on the day of the Lord. So it's very clear that even in incredibly gross sin, because he refused to let go of the Lord, the punishment that he was given was a horrible end to his life, the sin unto death, which John talks about later in, was it 1 John five sixteen? I want to say? Th these are real things, right? The cross of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ is greater than any sin except for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is the rejection of the Lord. That's another thing. The fact that there's any confusion about what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, I've already noted this in other videos, guys, but the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, in, in, the, in the context which the Lord brought it up, the Pharisees had just saw the miracles, specifically the healing of a blind man that only, A, God could do, and B, the Messiah would do, and that links the two. In other words, the Messiah is God. And the Pharisees were supposed to have known this, but instead of accepting it, knowing full well what, what, what Isaiah, the Psalms, all of that says about what the Messiah would do and be, um, they decided to say that a, a, an evil spirit or Satan was the one who was doing these things. That is literally calling the Holy Spirit's ministry of convincing you and them that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah that saves you, a liar. If you're calling the Spirit a liar about his ministry, about proving who Christ is, you're saying, I don't want to be saved. I don't want to accept the Messiah for who he is. I do not want any part in God's gift of eternal life. So whether you're the Pharisees denying the, 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 the miracles that absolutely prove that Jesus was the Messiah, or you're now hearing the gospel and rejecting Jesus Christ, those are the same thing. The fact that this isn't widely understood shows just how incredibly devolved we are as a generation and how pathetic and sad we are. The fact that we can't just accept what the word is clearly teaching. If all scripture doesn't line up, whatever's being brought up, whether it's legalism, once saved, always saved, preacher of rapture, all of these things, that's a whole nother story, Preacher of Rapture. Again, I've gone after that many times. I think that one is so obvious on its face, it's not funny. But that has become a religion in and of itself. And these people are cultists. Those people, people that hold on to one saved, always saved, extreme legalists, I view you the same as a cultist. If, in fact, you do hold like Christ as Lord and are actually saved, you're like this close to rejecting him because he doesn't fulfill your evil view of what faith should be. And we need to reject these things. We need to step away from them. So here's what I say. And here's what Paul says. We're supposed to be willing to defend and divide the word correctly. We're supposed to go out of our way to accept all scripture as God breathed. Let's see here. 1 Corinthians 2.16. Paul's going out of his way to quote Isaiah. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And then Paul goes out of his way of saying, we have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? It's scripture. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. It's, it's equating the weightiness and the value of Scripture with Christ himself. So we literally have the mind of Christ on our computers, in our cell phones, in our laps. Yes, not every translation is, is clear. Some of them are clear as mud, I'll be honest. There's a reason why I avoid the KJV. I know it's beautiful sounding, and some of the verses are dead on, and yes, you can be saved by it. But it's so incons... It, it's so... It's so, ah, man, confusing. We don't speak Middle English anymore, first off. The, they, thou, arts, so on. We don't say these things. So to, to use that Bible, to claim that it's somehow required to use that Bible, those of you who still claim that it's the only Bible we should be reading, come on. Come on. Anyone who holds any position and teaches must use the entire Bible as their guide, not just the parts that they like. First Timothy 1, 6-7. Some have wandered away from these 
truths of the Bible and turn to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. That's every single person that is not walking that narrow path, that is not willing to accept any and all scripture. If they come across a scripture that says very clearly or even, even, even indirectly that what they're teaching is out of line, their job is to stop. Not say that they know better. Go back and study. Look into the original languages. Figure out where it lies. And if it disproves them, it disproves them because God is trying to tell them something. But no, they fight it. They fight it. They wrestle with it. They call you names. They reject you. They fight with you over silly, simple things like water baptism, once saved, always saved, tribulational rapture. This should be a closed book. Problem is, is we live in a time where everybody just takes everybody else's word for it. 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21. Timothy, guard what has been trusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have wandered from the faith. Grace be to you. Listen, if you guys follow the ends of all of these crazy ideas, at some point you will be challenged by Satan to reject who Christ is. If you do not dig into the word and put it first thing, you are... What Matthew 10, 34 through 39 and Luke 12, 51 through 53, you are what is the result of Christ coming to earth is. And I'll read Luke. Do not think, do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one, fam there'll be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So on and so forth. The whole point of bringing the word, the whole point of Christ coming was not to get, have us all singing kumbaya around a fire. It was for us to put away all of our evil nonsense, be forgiven, and then submit to his word completely. And if at any point, any part of the Bible brings to question our actions, I have, I have come across this many times. But all the things that people today hold near and dear that are unbiblical, there's only one verse that sort of kind of might mean in our English, in our English language, which is not Greek might sort of kind of mean what they want it to mean but then there's 15 verses that go in the opposite direction tribulational rapture has the issue where the two major verses first corinthians 15 and first uh, thessalonians 4 it actually times the second echelon of, of of ascension with his return there's nowhere in between you can't you can't say i i know those verses i i hear what they what they say, but I want them to say this and then look at something like Philadelphia and say that because that particular era of good believers, which we are clearly not a part of, are, are held from or kept away from the tribulation, that does not apply to us. And if it does apply to us, it only applies to those of us who are firmly holding on to the word, trusting the Lord and getting ready for what's coming. And then he will spare us from all of those judgments. The problem is we live around a bunch of people who half-heartedly put one foot in the world and put one foot in the Bible, sort of, kind of, maybe a toe, take other people's words for it because they'd rather just trust men than go and be like the Bereans and actually dig through scripture instead of just handing over their trust to the first person that sounds good. It's the reason why I don't edit these videos, you guys. I am not the best speaker. Yes, I'm a salesperson. Yes, I am very passionate about what I do. That doesn't mean I know everything. And you guys can clearly pick up your Bibles. You can look through all the different translations. We have them all at our fingertips online now. You know, you could do the Greek studies. You could even email me and I will show you where in the Greek it points to these things. Did you guys know that Greek is literally like a series of, of roadmap signs that point to one another? The words actually point to what other word it's trying to accentuate. And in Greek, you can write it however you want because the little endings on each one of the words points back to what it's actually referring to. So English, unfortunately, you have to place things just right in a sentence for them to make sense. In Greek, not so much. And there's a reason why every single translation sounds a little bit different because there's about 15 different ways in English to say what they were trying to say in Greek. In the Greek, it's so clear. In English, it's, it's, like, it's like nuggets of gold in the mud sometimes, not always. Sometimes it's clear. Oh man, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen through 19, guys. In, in the first place, I hear that you come together as a church. I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. That is the entirety of our generation, by the way. No doubt, there have, been, there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. Somebody's right, guys. Somebody is on it. Somebody is actually doing the work that's necessary to be close to the Lord. Somebody is actually digging. It's not just me, by the way. There are others. My teacher is 10 times better at it than I am. He doesn't get online and speak like I do. Perhaps that's not his calling, perhaps mine. 
but that doesn't mean he can't explain these things in technical ways that I could only dream of. And I've gotten a lot better because I've been working at it, but I've been doing it for like 10, 11 years now. I'm not perfect, but I'm also not gonna stand down when I know when I'm talking to somebody who has a heretical idea. I'm gonna do it out of love. Unfortunately, I, I, can't, I can't do it perfectly the same way that Paul told uh, Timothy in uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, where he's telling him you need, you need to be gentle in spirit. I, I, I have I have suffered with this. I'm a, I'm a very, I'm a vicious person. I know I am. I've gotten a lot better. I've gotten to the point to where uh, my emotions don't get all jacked up because people keep saying evil things and slandering, but they say these things because they don't like to be challenged. They just want to be a pope in their own right. That is the making of a cult. Anyway, this was a bit of a ramble. But things are getting bad. We need to put our foot down on the word. We can't sit around and pretend like one verse that sort of kind of tells us what we want that goes against many others, and this is always the case, somehow validates an erroneous point. And if at any point you can't back it up with multiple scriptures, guys, there's a really good chance you're way off the path. The salvation of the Lord is a great thing, and even in our error, we can still be saved. We see many examples of that. I would rather, even in my greatest of errors, come around and repent and not end up in a position where I'm close to death, which I have been, by the way, guys. I have I have known a lot of the things that I teach and say for many, many years, and I have not acted on it because many stupid personal decisions. I don't believe I was extremely close to the sin unto death, but I was certainly on the path. And I highly advise that those of you who are feeling any kind of, of inkling that you may be in judgment, on your way to judgment, I pray you turn. I pray you just turn tail and run hard in the other direction. Leave your comments down below. Let me know what you think, guys. I'm sorry to ramble. It's getting bad out there. It's getting to the point to where everybody wants to be a teacher, but nobody actually wants to do the deep study. They're not being teachers. They're being defenders of their silly positions. This makes them, uh, this makes them more and more deeply embedded in error. The more you resist him too, the worse things are going to get. And the more and more we're deserving the tribulation. I pray for you guys. I really hope we're all on the same page that it's the Bible or nothing. But I know, I know, unfortunately, that's not the case. Things are going to start changing drastically here in the world. We're going to start seeing a lot of the Olivet Discourse come to life in a much, much more real way than it already has. And uh, those who are in error right now are in grave danger. And I pray for you guys. Like, share, subscribe, do the things. YouTube hates us. Yada, yada. I love you guys. Hope you're having a good day. Talk to you soon.